Hi, I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of the National Interest Magazine. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce two friends and colleagues, Dimitri K. Symes of the Center for the National Interest, CEO and President, who has recently returned from several weeks in Moscow, and Anatole Levin, a fellow at the Quincy Institute, who I first met several decades ago at Mattingly Hall in Cambridge. Our topic today is, once again, Russia, as it was when I first met Anatole. The question that I'd like to pose to our panelists to initiate the discussion, and our first speaker will be Dimitri, is, is there a viable path toward negotiations that conclude peacefully over the conflict in Ukraine? Or do the current policies that both the US and Russia are pursuing doom us to an inevitable and further cycle of escalation with unknown consequences? Dimitri. Uh, Jacob, it's a very good question. Uh, I think it is uh, fairly clear that both sides in the conflict are not uh, quite satisfied with the current situation. And they hope that there would be things that happen at the battlefield, which would improve their positions. I think that uh, clearly Kyiv has these hopes, and I think clearly Moscow has these hopes. So uh, if uh, a question is, uh, can the conflict be settled today? Very unlikely. Uh, however, uh, how much uh, escalation uh, you can allow without this escalation going out of control and becoming quite threatening to Ukraine, to Russia, to Europe, and uh, to the international stability itself? That's uh, a very tough question. For uh, many months uh, on Russian TV, you would uh, hear commentators, so-called military experts, making a case uh, that uh, as far as uh, Western supplies of weapons to Ukraine are concerned, uh, Western training of the Ukrainian military, well, uh, Russia shouldn't worry about that too much because the Ukrainians will never get sophisticated weapons, truly sophisticated modern weapons. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, uh, would not be sufficiently sophisticated, sufficiently trained to use these weapons, and they would not get enough of these weapons to make a difference. Now the tone is beginning uh, to change, uh, with new weapons uh, arriving to Ukraine every day in growing numbers, uh, coupled with very vigorous training of the Ukrainian military, the Russians are uh, beginning to see uh, they uh, are confronted with uh, a very serious military challenge and they do understand that there is a new dynamics at the battlefield. They still feel, however, that they have sufficient resources to manage the situation, not only uh, 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 in terms of uh, avoiding any retreat or surrender, uh, but even without uh, going uh, into a full-scale, uh, if you wish, military operation. What they call today is a special operation, and it is not uh, a special operation in name only. It clearly is uh, uh, somewhat restricted. Uh, it allows normal life uh, in, in uh, the most parts of Russia, uh, and the population, ordinary people, uh, don't feel much of an impact of this war. Uh, uh, the hope in Moscow is that they will be able to continue like that by being uh, more professional soldiers, by uh, recruiting uh, more manpower, military manpower in Russian ethnic republics, uh, and uh, that at a minimum they would be uh, capable of holding their own and perhaps have some minor military successes in southern Russia and in the Donetsk area. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that at this point, the expectation is uh, that it is not uh, likely uh, to, lead, to lead to an overwhelming Russian victory. Uh, 
that they have to control their uh, ambitions. And I think they will be open to negotiations, uh, I would say fairly soon, uh, particularly if they encounter uh, further Ukrainian advances and if they would have an impression that Zelensky is prepared to negotiate seriously. Anatole, tell us what you think about this. Well, I, I think that's pretty much exactly right. I mean, at the moment, uh, the military situation on the ground is tending, it seems to me, towards some form of stalemate. And uh, if uh, that continues long enough, then there will be an incentive for both sides uh, to reach at least some form of de facto ceasefire if both sides decide that they cannot, in fact, make uh, major additional gains. I mean, at the moment, Russia is obviously hoping, as Dmitry said, to you know, gain at least some more territory in the Donbass. But of course, Russian progress has been uh, agonizingly slow and casualties have been enormous, uh, in part precisely because of the weapons that have been provided. Um, as far as the risk of escalation is concerned, well, that would come above all if one side or another looks as if it's you know going to make major advances uh if as i think we both agree it is now pretty unlikely uh russia were to achieve some breakthrough that would you know threaten the really serious defeat of the ukrainians then you would see massive pressure in the united states and in europe to some extent to give greatly increased aid to the ukrainians uh if as clearly some people and institutions uh, in Washington and in Europe hope the Ukrainians are able to use Western weaponry and their own forces seriously to drive the Russians back. I mean, to the point where Russia is facing, you know, outright and obvious defeat. That is when it seems to me the threat of escalation becomes truly serious because uh, an outright defeat of that kind would certainly, I think, pose uh, some form of domestic threat as well uh, to the Putin administration. And uh, on the one hand, um, that would lead to the kind of domestic mobilization, which, as Dmitry has said, uh, Russia has not engaged in to date. But there would also uh, obviously be a strong temptation or incentive uh, to put additional military pressure on the West uh, in an effort to terrify the Europeans in particular uh, into um, seeking a, a, a negotiated settlement. So I think that's where the, the, the danger lies. But on balance, it seems to me that um, as things stand at the moment, we are tending towards military stalemate. Are we? The reason I ask is that, for example, retired General Ben Hodges, who served in Europe, is predicting a, all, a sweeping Russian defeat in the coming months, that the army is demoralized, exhausted, low on weaponry, the Ukrainians are being resupplied. They're gearing up for a massive offensive, apparently, in the South. How likely is it that the Russian army will, in fact, be defeated in Ukraine and perhaps reduced to defending Crimea? Dmitry, why don't you answer that first? Well, uh, uh, as far as the Crimea is concerned, uh, let's be clear what is going on right now. First, uh, the main airport in Crimea, uh, in uh, Simferopol, uh, that airport is already closed for months. Uh, and in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, regular air connection with Crimea, uh, it practically does not exist. Uh, so there are uh, two connections. Uh, one is the Crimean Bridge, and another is through the Kherson province. And uh, through uh, that province, now uh, Crimea is also supplied with water. In 2014, the Ukrainians cut uh, water supply from the Dnieper River to Crimea. Uh, it was a major challenge to the population, not much covered or discussed anywhere in the West, but it was a major challenge. Now the Russians were able to restore that water supply. Uh, 
Now try to imagine the situation uh, when the Ukrainian military was able to push uh, uh, Russian troops out of the Kherson province and simultaneously as some senior Ukrainian uh, officials brought, they would use new American weapons to destroy the Crimean bridge. Then uh, Crimea would become uh, almost completely isolated and very vulnerable. And you would uh, also expect that it would be difficult for them to maintain the Navy there, and they would have uh, to move it elsewhere, perhaps uh, uh, to the east of Novorossiysk. I think it would be a monumental uh, defeat uh, for Russia. It would uh, be a monumental defeat, and it would be viewed in Russia as a monumental defeat. Uh, and in Russia, I think that you now you see a strong nationalist mood. Uh, we read a lot and a lot about all these people who are leaving Russia in disgust over uh, this war. And there are such people, thousands of them. But there are many, many millions who uh, now uh, represent a new Russian patriotic consensus. It was not easy for Putin to create this consensus. And it would be even more difficult for Putin to ignore it. So it's very difficult for me to imagine uh, that uh, uh, if there was a major successful Russian offense, sorry, successful Ukrainian offensive, which would endanger Russian control of Crimea, uh, that the Russians would just say, enough is enough, let's sign an agreement, uh, or we surrender. I think then you would see a very serious escalation. And uh, I repeat, uh, Russia is suffering from lack of manpower. But that is the result of a political decision not to proceed with a serious mobilization. The Ukrainians move from one mobilization after another. This option is clearly open to Russia. Russia also has thousands and thousands uh, of all bombs and missiles from the Soviet period. These are not really precision guided munitions. But if you want uh, to, to send the bombers to destroy Kiev, uh, Russia certainly has this capability. So my concern is that those who are talking about uh, Ukrainian easy victory, they kind of assume uh, that Russia would absorb the blow and surrender. That would not be my assumption at all. Nor mine. That, that's what I mean. I think if, you know, if Russia is facing outright defeat and the possible loss of, of Crimea, then Russia would have to escalate. I, I see no no alternative to that. Let me sharpen this for you, Anatole. Uh, I, and I should also note to all of our viewers, I am not simply happy, but would be delighted to pose your questions to our interlocutors today. There is a box at the bottom of your screen where you can type in a question. Now, Anatole, I would, all, I would be delinquent if I did not note that in the same issue of the national interest, the new issue to which you just contributed, there is also another piece, a fiery piece, that is something that you alluded to more broadly when you talked about institutions in Washington. We have a piece from Melinda Herring of the Atlanta Council, where she argues in the national interest that it is time to crush Russia in Ukraine. And she says it is, quote, time to bring the hammer down on Vladimir Putin. What happens if we do that? Well, I, I think Russia uh, would um, at that stage do something along the lines of, um, for example, uh, bombarding uh, well, certainly, as Dmitry has said, vastly extend its uh, bombardment of um, Ukrainian cities. But I think uh, there would also be a very strong temptation in Moscow to do something like fire conventional missiles uh, into Poland at NATO communication lines. Not, I think, with any serious uh, hope of badly disrupting those NATO supplies, but once again, uh, with a view to frightening the West into a peace settlement, um, possibly some form of threat against the um, against the, the the Baltic states. The other thing one has to keep in mind there is the possible role of China. Um, now, 
contrary to much of the Washington consensus, China has in fact been, uh, in this as in other cases, by the way, extremely cautious. I mean, of course, China is not going to side with America uh, against Russia. I mean, anyone who seriously uh, expected that, you, you know, has more or less signed their letter of resignation as a serious expert. Uh, but so far, China has not um, given massive economic aid to Russia, only limited military aid. But I think if China were faced with um, the kind of scenario which Dr. Herring and her colleagues are obviously hoping for, whereby uh, Russia suffers such a crushing defeat in Ukraine that it is eliminated as a serious uh, actor on the world stage, where the Russian administration is brought down with the very uh, I mean, certainly the, the tremendous weakening of Russia, but the possibility even uh, of the breakup of the Russian state. Uh, I think that that would be regarded in Beijing as such a threat to Chinese vital interests um, in the world uh, that they would uh, vastly increase their help to Russia um, in uh, an effort to, to ward that off without, of course, becoming directly involved in the war themselves. But there is a good deal that they could do to help, which they have not been doing so far. So let me. Uh, Jacob, I, have to you, say, go ahead. I do not understand. Uh, I unfortunately uh, have not read the article, uh, but uh, uh, I heard a lot from uh, U.S. Uh, senior retired military officers how they think Russia should be defeated, but I did not hear uh, a single coherent explanation of how Russia is going to react to such a Ukrainian offensive. And why do they think Russia would uh, swallow it? Uh, if you are in Moscow and you talk to uh, ordinary people, uh, people uh, upper middle class, successful, uh, mostly quite uh, skeptical uh, about uh, the Putin rule because he's not exactly the cup of tea. Uh, they increasingly uh, would tell you they do not know how this war has started, who is telling the truth. They don't quite believe the side, but they increasingly have a sense that this is a hostile West attacking Russia, that this is like Hitler, that this is like Napoleon, uh, this is like the Poles uh, and the Swedes. Uh, occupying parts of Russia, occupying Moscow in the uh, uh, 17th century, uh, that this is something they have to resist using all their resources. And when uh, I would ask them, but when you talk about something like that, do you understand that major escalation can easily turn nuclear? And Jacob, you would be shocked. You hear from perfectly normal, educated people, not fanatics of any sort, a very fatalistic response. They would tell you, look, what needs to be done will have to be done. We do not quite uh, uh, affect these decisions. Putin uh, would uh, make this determination. Uh, but uh, uh, if Russia has to defend itself, if we have to die in the process, that's obviously not what we want. That's obviously not what we welcome. <clears throat> but we will be prepared to do it. It's a very different mood that you would find anywhere uh, in the West. And I think uh, to ignore this Russian mindset, uh, you can do it only at a great peril. And indeed, I mean, if you look at General Hodges and others, uh, to a considerable extent, this is what they've been doing for 30 years, right? um, you know, uh, concocting US and Western policies. Uh, with no reference to the likely response from the other side. Uh, so this is <laughs> not exactly a good precedent for, for US policy making. Uh, but I agree. I mean, this is also what I've been hearing from my Russian friends. Now, how far this would play out in practice, of course, if uh, there were mass conscription in, in Russia, one doesn't know. But certainly, as Dmitry says, um, the mood in uh, Russia, it may be less um, determined than the mood in Ukraine, but it is a great deal more determined than the mood anywhere in the West. So we think, but Russia also has a history of, of sudden collapse, or at least upheaval, 1905, 
1917. 1989 was more exhaustion than a direct military defeat. But how would both of you rate the chances for an unexpected collapse of, of Russia in the face of a defeat in Ukraine? Well, Jacob, first, 1905, uh, let's be clear, there was no Russian collapse. There was a revolution. Well, there was, there, was, revolution. there was Russian revolution, which was uh, uh, defeated. Uh, and uh, uh, it was over the, the war with Japan, which was fought outside Russian territory, which was completely alien to the vast majority of Russians, particularly Russian peasants, who were drafted into the army. In uh, 1917, of course, there was a, a revolutionary collapse, uh, but it was after uh, more than two years of a very painful war uh, to which Russia was basically technologically unprepared, suffered totally uh, disproportional losses. Uh, and you have seen a major portion of the Russian elite uh, turning against the Tsar, uh, against his bureaucratic regime, uh, all the scandals uh, associated with uh, Rasputin, uh, all these allegations of treason. Uh, most of these allegations, I uh, hope and at all would agree, were quite unfounded. There was a very painful revolution at the end. Uh, that's why uh, Putin is so reluctant uh, to have a major war. That is why he is so eager uh, to treat it <clears throat> as a special operation. I do not know uh, what would uh, uh, happen uh, if Russia, uh, Putin's Russia, would have to fight uh, the, the collective West uh, for more than two years. I do not know that. But I do know that during that war, there were no nuclear weapons. And uh, the nuclear weapons happened to be a great equalizer, which allow you uh, to do things uh, if you are being defeated, which allow you to do things, which would preclude any further advances against you. But in the process, of course, it can lead to a catastrophic escalation and the destruction of our civilization. So uh, historical parallels in this case are very risky. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I do think that if Russia were completely defeated in Ukraine, uh, that would very likely lead to the, the fall of uh, uh, the Russian regime and perhaps the destruction of the Russian state. But for that reason, as Dmitry has said, I think that the Russian government would do everything in its power and run colossal risks uh, to prevent that happening. Um, and, you know, we, we do have to remember how the, the number of times in the Cold War when we came terribly close to, to nuclear mm -hmm. annihilation, um, you know, and if we get into a situation where, well, you, you know, the, the advocates, uh, <laughs> talking about the Atlantic Council, of, um, uh, of what is called a no-fly zone, but which means sending the American Air Force to, as the air wing of the Ukrainian army, um, that leads directly to a situation in which um, Russia and NATO are firing missiles, conventional missiles, sure, but into each other's territory. You know, you are then getting when you know when dealing with the two greatest nuclear powers on the planet by far, you are getting awfully close to the brink of catastrophe. We have a question from Professor Barry Posen of MIT, who asks. What do we actually know about the state of the Russian military in Russia? Hodges and others seem to think that the Russian cupboard is bare. My own sense is that the Russian army, those units that are still in Russia, have been brought up to strength, often with mobilized reservists. This could be a third to a half of the units attributed to the Russian army. Putin chooses not to commit them, at least so far, but they could be committed. Anatole, what do you think? Yes, I, th I think that's right. I mean, as Dmitry has stressed, Russia has really not deployed uh, 
as, as meant as much of its resources as it could have to date. Now, obviously, a reason for that must be serious doubts about the quality of these re reservists and these units. Uh, but um, if Russia has to, it can also greatly boost its manpower uh, and uh, its firepower in Ukraine. Yes, not very accurate, uh, but the notion, you know, the the that, as you say, that the Russian cupboard is bare seems to me a, a tremendous exaggeration. Dimitri. Well, uh, uh, let me say first uh, that we hear a lot uh, about uh, courageous Ukrainian resistance, how they improve uh, uh, their skills, how they perform better than uh, anybody expected. If you look at the beginning of this war, you would not say any of that uh, about the Russian military. Now, from everything I know, and I talk to uh, particularly a lot of Russian journalists who cover this war, and these journalists, I can assure you, have very different attitudes, and many of them do not support this war at all. But basically what uh, you, you hear from them uh, that uh, the Russian military is fighting better and better, uh, that you see uh, a lot of uh, profiles uh, in courage, uh, that uh, the things uh, like uh, disastrous logistics, uh, uh, very poor communications, inability to coordinate between different military services, that all these things uh, are being addressed, not brilliantly addressed. Uh, not uh, uh, in a way uh, that you would say, uh, what a fantastic performance. But uh, it is becoming considerably more adequate uh, than it was at the beginning. Uh, all uh, military commanders, uh, those who, who commanded uh, a major Russian group of forces were replaced. Uh, I hear that they have deserved to be replaced. And they hear from the critics of the war, let me emphasize, I hear from the critics of the war in Russia uh, that new commanders are better. I do not know how much better, but are better. So you have to understand uh, that the Russian military is hardly uh, a paper tiger. Human uh, reserves in Russia are very considerable. Clearly, uh, if they proceed with full mobilization, most of these people would not be well trained, and you would not see an instant increase in Russian performance. Uh, but uh, it's not a matter of years, as the Ukrainians have demonstrated. It is a matter of uh, months uh, to educate and to train your soldiers. And I think the Russians would be capable of that. I also have to say uh, that uh, this uh, very clear striking difference between using nuclear and conventional weapons, which you see now in the West, you do not quite see it in Russia. And uh, uh, obviously, well, one reason is uh, that there is more uh, uh, discussion of what nuclear weapons can do in the West than in Russia. But another reason is uh, that a lot of uh, people uh, 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 in the West, particularly in Washington, uh, who uh, want to have a major offensive against Russia. They do not want to discuss a nuclear dimension. You know, uh, Jacob, from our experience in the national interest, how some of uh, top uh, military people would be unhappy with uh, articles uh, which would discuss a possibility of military of uh, escalation uh, leading to uh, a use of nuclear weapons because they think that if such a discussion would have a paralyzing impact on the United States to conduct muscular diplomacy. Uh, in Russia, uh, there is a sense uh, that they are clearly weaker uh, than NATO in conventional forces. They do understand, they take it for granted that if there would be a protracted military conflict with NATO, Russia would have to be defeated. They are fully aware of that, they accept that. But they also believe that because they have nuclear weapons, 
nobody would quite dare to go that far. And they uh, also feel that if somebody would dare, well, then they would need to do what they need to do. And uh, that is one reason uh, I personally would not want to see further escalation. And I would not want uh, to take chances with our collective destiny. We have uh, two questions that run on parallel tracks. So I will pose them together. From Melinda Herring, she asks, how and when does this end? Should we expect a messy ongoing grinding conflict or something else? And then Robert Blackwell asks, what is an acceptable outcome of this war for Vladimir Putin? Does it include the annexation of the Donbass, Anatol? Well, how this, th this war ends, I, I find it um, unfortunately difficult to imagine now a comprehensive peace settlement. Uh, perhaps we can hope for something along the lines of Cyprus. Uh, whereby you get a de facto territorial compromise accompanied by a ceasefire. Uh, I fear, though, it will be a much less stable ceasefire than in, uh, than in the case of Cyprus. Uh, but uh, if, um, in, in essence, both sides fight each other to a standstill, that is where we'll, one will end up. And I think that, in the end, short of an outright victory for both sides, uh, which uh, in the case of Russia does not look possible. And in the case of Ukraine, as we've been discussing, would be, well, we don't know whether it's possible. Uh, it certainly would be appallingly dangerous. Uh, you will end up with some kind of de facto territorial compromise on the ground, which, by the way, uh, is what we have had since 2014. Uh, it would be al along new lines with probably Russia holding, you know, more territory. But it's important to note, I think, which is too often forgotten, uh, in the Western media still talks in terms of this being an existential struggle from Ukraine's point of view. Now, that one could say to an extent was true at the very beginning, when it appears to have been Russia's intention to capture Kiev, to replace the Ukrainian government, to turn Ukraine into a satellite state. Uh, but it, it seems to me that whatever some Russian statements may may suggest uh, that goal is over. Um, so Ukraine has already won a great victory for its independence and its Western course. What we're talking about now is actually a battle for you know much more limited amounts of territory uh, in eastern and southern Ukraine. Um, as to the annexation of the Donbass, uh, well. You know, R Russia has recognized the independence of the Donbass republics. Now, of course, a, a key question there is, you know, Russia, totally contrary to all the military predictions, including, it must be remembered by General Hodges and his colleagues, uh, but contrary to all these predictions before the war, Russia has not yet managed even to conquer the whole of the Donbass. Half of, Uk of uh, Donetsk Oblast, territorially speaking, is still in Ukrainian hands. Uh, so um, undoubtedly to be able to claim, well, the, the thing is that as Demetrius stressed, the narrative now in Russia and the mood of much of the Russian population uh, is that uh, this is a war of resistance against Western expansionism. Now, go into the, you know, the, the, the truth or rather untruth of this, portrayal. But of course, that does uh, allow Putin to claim success for, in principle, for less than the goals that he initially set out to achieve, because he can, you know, by presenting this as a, 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 a war that has managed to, to, to fight Ukraine to a standstill, despite massive Western uh, support for Ukraine, that can still be presented, it seems to me, as a uh, as a Russian success. So no, I don't think Putin has to annex the, uh, the, the Donbass. Um, he just has to uh, hang on to what Russia has already and perhaps a bit more. Dimitri? Well, first, uh, let me repeat what uh, I said uh, at the outset. Uh, 
I don't believe that the two sides are prepared to accept uh, any uh, lasting agreement at this point. Uh, both sides feel that they can further improve their situation, and we will have to see uh, what happens on the ground, how uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive goes. Uh, are they successful uh, in uh, taking over Kherson? Uh, what happens uh, in, in Donetsk, in the Donetsk province, where, as Anatol said, there is still uh, a lot of fighting? <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, Donetsk itself is now more vulnerable because the Ukrainians have long range artillery, is more vulnerable uh, to bombardment than it was uh, at any time since uh, uh, 2014 when the, when the Ukrainians were, were very close to the city. So uh, unfortunately, some people will have to die. Uh, some blood is going to be spilled before any agreement can be reached. Now, what kind of an agreement can be reached uh, uh, if both sides finally uh, come to a realization uh, that it would be difficult for them to have uh, uh, meaningful uh, gains in the battlefield? I uh, have to ask a very simple question. Are you talking uh, about uh, a stalemate at the battlefield? Or are you talking uh, about a comprehensive agreement? Because uh, uh, clearly, if uh, you are Vladimir Putin, and if you are being uh, told uh, that uh, you have to allow uh, the Ukrainians to reconquer Kherson or uh, any other uh, provinces uh, in that area, that you, you will have uh, less than complete uh, control uh, over Donbass. You know, it's not a, a happy proposition uh, for any Russian leader at this point. But uh, if you are able to say, look, we fought against the collective West. Uh, uh, they have uh, many more people, great economic uh, might, more uh, uh, forces. And we essentially were able to come uh, to a standstill. And as a result, they are prepared to sign an agreement. Kyiv is prepared to sign an agreement. Most of the sanctions are going to be uh, lifted. Uh, uh, Russia will no longer be isolated against the collective West. Uh, they tried to do it. It did not work out. They are prepared to accommodate us. And essentially, we are going back to a relative normalcy. I think if Putin was offered something like that, and there was a, sta a statement at the battlefield, I think it would be a very difficult agreement to reject. Do you agree, Anatole? Yes, I, I do agree. Um, and as I say, if, if we are attending to a military stalemate, uh, then that is possible. But of course, the question is, uh, whether the West could bring itself to, to, to make such an offer uh, to Russia. Something, by the way, to note here is, is that, I mean, since this war, for the first time, Ukraine has a genuine, as opposed to false and hypocritical, possibility of moving uh, towards membership of the European Union. It will take a long time, but until the war, EU offers in this regard were, in my view, uh, utterly empty, actually. Uh, now, because of the sympathy generated by the war, this is a, a real possibility for Ukraine. But we need to note that it is not a possibility that can be pursued as long as the war continues. Um, even, uh, you know, what I described as an unstable ceasefire with constant outbreaks of violence would make it, uh, in my view, almost impossible uh, for Ukraine to progress uh, towards real membership of the West. So, uh, you know, Ukraine does, properly seen in my view, uh, also have a, a, a strong incentive to reach some kind of peace agreement. But of course, the emotional and political obstacles to that are huge. I'd like to follow up with both of you on that and in the form partly of posing a question from Vil Korpola, who asks, could ending the Western economic sanctions de-escalate the situation enough to bring Russia and the West to the negotiating table? I'd like to add my own 
footnote here. You both seem to think that we can possibly return to some degree of normalization in relations with Russia. But the war has, of course, had its own momentum. And Dmitry, you've alluded to me about the shrinking of political space in Russia itself. You see articles about the explicit attempts to now rejigger the Russian school curriculum to encourage nationalism and patriotism. And finally, there were immense costs associated with pulling out of Russia for Western firms that had invested in the country. How likely is it really that we could return to normalcy and would Putin actually want to do that? Or is he exploiting the situation to, to actually solidify his own rule inside Russia? I realize I've thrown a mouthful at you, but. Well, it seems to me that uh, we all understand that uh, what has happened has happened, that uh, both sides have very different uh, narratives. Both sides uh, have uh, very different experiences, the way they uh, interpret their experiences. And uh, it's very unlikely uh, that uh, they would be prepared uh, to embrace each other as if nothing has happened. You mentioned uh, 1905. Well, clearly in 1905, the Tsarist regime uh, survived uh, in Russia. Uh, the emperor uh, survived and uh, triumphed in Tokyo. And yet, uh, two or three years later, Japan and Russia became allies and friends. And there were not uh, really bitter feelings uh, on, on either side. Something like that clearly is not going to happen between Russia and the West. So when I'm talking about normalization, I'm not talking about a, a kind of um, warm feelings toward each other, uh, a sense that we uh, uh, basically share the same values, that our interests uh, uh, are uh, not in fundamental conflict. I don't think it's likely to happen. And uh, I think that actually, uh, an element of realism about very different interests and very different uh, values, uh, and to some extent different civilizations in Russia and the West, an element of realism about that may be constructive. Having said that, Jacob, my concern is that people who are against this kind of normalization, uh, my concern is that they did not uh, uh, think seriously about how uh, it is going to affect American security and, uh, if you wish, the basic international stability. Uh, the assumption that we would be strangulating Russia, uh, that we would be destabilizing uh, the Putin rule, and that uh, they would sit in Moscow idly, and they would not be looking for all kinds of solutions, for all kinds of schemes, which would undermine, destabilize, severely damage Western interests. I think it's naive. Uh, we have this very sinister view of the Russian leadership. And yet we think that we would be doing the things which would be very damaging to them, and they would not resist. Uh, uh, we just saw uh, fair signs of uh, uh, Russian new uh, closeness with Iran. You can see signs of a new Russian closeness with North Korea. The uh, uh, people from Taliban now spend uh, more and more time in Moscow. Uh, and the Chinese, they are not prepared to provide arms to Russia, uh, but uh, they clearly more and more uh, adopt Russian narrative about what this war uh, is about. I think that we uh, are watching an emergence of counter coalition against the United States and American allies. And it would be a counter coalition, which would include radical states, states which we uh, consider international pariahs uh, and led by governments, which are prepared to do whatever. Uh, but uh, they couldn't do uh, uh, much of that whatever against the United States. 
in the absence of uh, a strong international pattern. If they get such pattern in Moscow, I think the world is not going to be uh, uh, the same for long. Anatole, have we been hoist by our own petard on the economic sanctions? And are we going to confront what Dmitry has spelled out, a coalition that is forming in reaction to the West? Well, I mean, Western economic sanctions and you know Russia's response um, in energy terms and food terms has, of course, been um, mutually destructive. I mean, you know, the Russia has undoubtedly suffered terribly, but yes, uh, the West has suffered. We don't know what is going to happen this winter, um, and uh, of course, very grave threats uh, to other parts of the world, um, both from energy prices. Um, and food shortages, and one already sees the consequences of this in Sri Lanka and Pakistan, for example. So, uh, I mean, I think, to, to, to repeat, I mean, one thing which has been very evident about this in NATO and Western planning, uh, but, you know, once again, I mean, this goes back a generation by now, has been, as Dimitri says, precisely a, an extraordinary failure to think about likely Russian responses. I mean, when the uh, offer or the possibility of an offer of uh, NATO membership, a ma membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia first came up, um, you know, was then uh, enshrined, of course, at the Bucharest uh, summit, uh, I, I discovered talking to NATO officers that there were no contingency plans at all, none uh, to, to defend either of these countries. Uh, if they became NATO members. Uh, indeed, anyone who suggested it uh, was, um, well, you know, as we've heard today, to, to suggest that was taken as, in effect, arguing against NATO membership and therefore was a career wrecker uh, as far as NATO officials were concerned. Well, that is a, <laughs> an appalling way to conduct Western strategy. I mean, deeply irresponsible. Um, and uh, deeply damaging for Western interests, as, as well as, of course, of exposing Georgia and Ukraine themselves to colossal risks. I have a pointed and precise question from Drew Guff, our chairman, who asks, as Russia has come to terms with turning its mostly commodity export economy, which Drew calls Russia Incorporated, to the East and to non-aligned Asian markets, can you discuss what does Russia look like in five years with some thought about what it actually means to run an economy in the absence of repairs to installed Western technology platforms and no meaningful investment from China? Anatole? Well, let, let us see about the investment from China. As I said, I mean, Chinese policy is not fixed. And uh, if China sees Russia really beginning to fail, uh, I think from my own conversations with Chinese, they would in fact uh, feel obliged, very much against their will, but still uh, obliged to give more support. Uh, but I mean, undoubtedly, Russia is going to face uh, tremendous problems. I mean, you are go go going to see a country which in certain respects um, does begin to look, a, you know, a bit like Cuba with, with, with things held together by string um, and duct tape. Uh, but um, as we have seen from numerous other examples, in indeed, the Soviet Union itself was a, a bit like that, if you you know remember. Well, Dmitry knows it far better than I do, of course. But that that was rather the way that the Soviet Union uh, operated. But that did not stop the Soviet Union, of course, uh, from running a tremendously powerful military and military industrial complex. I mean, one thing that I I think looks obviously inevitable uh, is that Russia is going to become much much more dependent over time on China. Um, and obviously, I mean, that will give huge advantages to China when it comes to um, fixing energy prices to China's advantage. Uh, how much China will be prepared to give Russia in response? Uh, 
remains to be seen. But as I say, I, in my view, that will also depend on just how much danger Beijing thinks that Russia and the Russian state are in. Dimitri, what is, what is your take on Drew's question? Well, it's a very uh, good question and a very tough one, including for Russia itself. Because clearly uh, uh, a predicament uh, uh, Drew have uh, described uh, is uh, serious and real. Uh, and uh, uh, that is one reason I am cautiously optimistic that if they are offered uh, an opportunity to have any kind of meaningful normalization with the West, uh, that they would not cavalierly reject it, even if they are unhappy uh, with uh, the territorial side of uh, any solution. Uh, if that does not work, well, uh, I just uh, read a very interesting book about uh, somebody who lived in the United States uh, for uh, uh, many years. Uh, and uh, he was under the radar. And uh, uh, some senior officials knew who this person was. Most uh, uh, did not. His name was General Orlov. He uh, was a, a Soviet defector. He commanded uh, Soviet secret operations uh, in Spain during the Spanish uh, Civil War. And he managed to escape Stalin and come to the United States without announcing himself and lived literally for, for decades uh, 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 almost underground. So why I am bringing this gentleman? I'm bringing this gentleman not because of what he did in Spain, where among other things, he killed a lot of Trotskyites, and not because uh, he recruited the infamous Cambridge spies, including uh, Kim Philby and Donald McLean, but because of what he was doing earlier in Germany. Uh, he headed uh, a Russian secret operation in Germany, uh, which was designed to steal German and other European technology and to make uh, secret arrangements which would allow the Germans uh, to disregard some of the restrictions uh, imposed on them by Versailles, and then return to cooperate with the Russians and give them things which Moscow wanted, but could not otherwise get. As you do possibly know, probably know, uh, Putin already have signed an agree, a decree uh, allowing what uh, uh, they call parallel imports, meaning imports of uh, Western goods and Western technology uh, without appropriate licenses essentially an underground operation, and apparently it is conducted on a fairly massive scale. If you would combine this operation uh, with a, a willingness to deliver Russian energy resources on favorable terms to a variety of foreign countries, I think uh, you can get a lot of things uh, which the United States would not want to see in Russian hands. So the bottom line is, uh, would Russia be damaged by uh, current restrictions by this isolation from the West? No question about that. Uh, would it put uh, Russia in a dependent position vis-a-vis -vis China? Probably. Uh, would it uh, prevent Russia from developing military technology and being able to defend itself and threaten others? No. I think that they would be able to maintain this capability exactly as Stalin did in the late 20s and 30s. We have a, another question from Barry Posen that uh, is quite apposite. He notes that we've talked a lot about nuclear escalation, but asks what other forms of escalation could take place short of a nuclear conflict? We have not discussed today energy or cyber attacks. Cyber attacks have not taken place. No one is quite sure why. Russia has announced that it will apply something of a tourniquet to gas supplies to Germany and is clearly trying to muscle over Western Europe. 
what what is each of your perspectives, starting with Anatole? How far do you think Russia can and will go in in such arenas? Well, uh, once again, I, I think how far it will go depends on the extent of the of the threat to Russia's position in in Ukraine, um, and the, the 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 danger of outright defeat. Uh, in response to that, I can easily imagine um, a total cutoff of energy supplies to Europe. That would, of course, be tremendously damaging to um, uh, to, to Russia's own resources. But once again, you know, if they were facing outright defeat, they might see themselves having no no choice in the matter. Um, I would imagine that they would try to time that uh, to make it as painful as possible for the Europeans. In other words, you know, with winter coming on. Uh, uh, as far as uh, cyber attacks are concerned, yes, I mean, the absence of this has been very interesting. Now, uh, an, uh, an obvious possible explanation, but certainly a plausible one, uh, is that, uh, as indeed the American authorities uh, said to the New York Times a couple of years ago, um, America has put itself in a position, or at least they said that it has, uh, to inflict massive damage on Russian infrastructure through cyber attacks. Uh, if Russia uh, in, engages um, in such uh, attacks. But of course, uh, Russia could well, you know, not attack America directly, but um, attack particular European countries, and in the hope that America would not endanger its own infrastructure by massively responding. But so far, um, a kind of balance of terror uh, on that appears to have um, mutually assured destruction uh, appears to have been established. But once again, um, you know, mutually assured destruction during the Cold War was accompanied from the early 1950s on by a clear decision by both sides not to engage in proxy wars in Europe aimed at the complete destruction of each other's positions. That was decided by Stalin in the late 40s. It was decided by Eisenhower when he came to, to, to power. Now, that is something which uh, the West has to a degree abandoned, and there are you know, very powerful voices suggesting that we should abandon that completely. Now, if we do, if we break that basic Cold War limitation, in Europe, then it would seem logical to assume uh, that all the other limitations fly out of the window as well. Dimitri. Jacob, I was in Moscow two weeks ago. Uh, life is normal. Uh, the restaurants are full. The boulevards uh, are crowded. The cafe society is, uh, they are not able to go to Europe. So they're celebrating uh, uh, right there on the terraces of uh, Russian restaurants. Uh, you go to uh, food stores uh, and uh, uh, everything is available. You would not know that there is uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, major restriction on what Russia uh, is entitled to buy. Uh, Western clothes, uh, Western cars, everything is available. Mind you, of course, it's just five months since this war has started, but so far it is so good uh, for the Russian middle class. And it's clearly a major component of Putin's strategy. He wants to conduct what is a very brutal war in Ukraine while maintaining normalcy at home. Uh, that's a very important component of his strategy. Uh, and that allows him greater freedom of maneuver in Ukraine, but it also clearly imposes certain restrictions uh, on what he could do. And if uh, uh, Russia would engage in cyber warfare, for instance, or uh, total cutoffs of energy supplies, uh, it would have uh, rather unfortunate consequences for the lives of ordinary Russians, the Putin consistency. Uh, and this uh, constituency is uh, very important to him because uh, 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 people question the quality of Russian democracy, but Putin's support uh, 
is clearly very strong according even to opposition public opinion polls. And I think uh, that is something we should keep in mind, which gives us an element of hope that we can reach an agreement, but we also should caution us uh, that if the conflict escalates, there are a lot of things they have not done so far, which would be easily available to them if needed. Let me ask as a final question to both of you, a speculative one, where are we in by January? Are we going to see Europe buckling under the weight of crippled energy supplies? Or do you think that the West will be able to maintain its resolve and that will simply be mired in, a, in, a, in where we are now in a status quo conflict? Dimitri? Well, I think it's likely to, to get worse before it gets any better. And I don't uh, expect a real catastrophe uh, in, in most European countries. Uh, but I do think uh, the, the Russians are increasingly playing hardball, uh, I repeat, with certain restrictions, but it is clearly hardball, and we have serious tests uh, ahead of us. Well, you know, this also depends, of course, on the state of the world economy and Western economies, uh, and obviously so many other factors are involved in this, but if by late autumn, you know, we are facing the, either the reality or the very strong prospect uh, of serious economic recession throughout the West, then I think that the pressure to, to try to reach some kind of at least provisional agreement or ceasefire in Ukraine and reopen uh, at least, you know, some Russian energy supplies uh, will become very strong. But as I say, this doesn't just, just depend on the situation in Ukraine, it also depends on much wider economic factors. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Dimitri for sharing his insights on his recent visit, and also express my gratitude to Anatole, a valued contributor to our magazine and website, one of, I, I think one of the most brilliant analysts in foreign policy today, for joining us. And thank you to our viewers. And with this, I conclude our session.